Hello and welcome everyone to today's weekly commentary from Stashaway. Uh, today is January 18th, uh, 2019, and I'm here joined by my uh, co-host and our Chief Investment Officer, uh, Freddie Lim. Hello. Um, so this is kind of like a little bit of a new format that we are, we're doing here. We're kind of um, spreading it on different platforms um, so we can uh, reach more of you because that's been kind of the feedback we've been getting uh, over the last few seminars that we actually did as well. Um, so going forward, we'll do every do a weekly commentary on kind of what the market holds and kind of give some lessons on, you know, on how do you invest better or how what can make you a better investor in general. So um, as always, please feel free to ask any of your questions um, down below in the comment section. Uh, we'll gather them together and uh, throughout, you know, throughout the year, um, get to them in one of those uh, commentary sections. Anyways, for today, we have a couple um, updates. Um, first of all, I think we wanted to um, share a little bit about um, all the main topics that happened last year because they're kind of like still going on into 2019, Freddie. Um, so we'll give a little bit of an update on um, the trade war. We'll look at a little bit about how far is Brexit? Is it even possible? Or what's going on there, right? There's a lot of news items about that, especially this week. Um, we'll also look at the um, government shutdown that kind of occurred just before Christmas or just before the year end. And then we'll kind of look at the markets and see how does it all play out because it's, the noise is exactly the same, right? But uh, markets this week and last week have completely changed, right? So mm -hmm. we get that uh, at the end as well. So Freddie, with that being said, um, last night there was some flip-flopping going on. Anything that you would like to say about you know, the ongoing trade war? Is this close to resolve or any progress being made? Well, as a background, yeah. uh, last night uh, there's some sort of rumors floating around that the US is uh, thinking about pairing back uh, some of the tariffs that's already been imposed on Chinese products. I would caution against overreacting too positively to it as well, because as we have learned time and time and again, there's a lot of flip flop, there's a lot of rumors. Steve Nunchin has no teeth. Uh, he's apparently the person who floated the idea. Robert Littizer is the guy on trade. So that's not a consensus out there. So please do not react to any short-term rumors or or even to Steve Nguyen-Chin's statement because there's going to be a lot of flip-flopping uh, as we have seen in 2018. You continue to stick to an investment plan as per normal. You're not going to accelerate your decision today. Okay, so so you don't see, because I think when are the 90 days done? Are they done at it's the about early, March? March. Early, March. early March? Early March, so it's not that much time either, right? It's like we're already in the middle of uh, Jen. Yeah, so Vice Premier Liu He is going to travel to the US and and have another round. So actively engaging each other, that sounds good. The market, the market is happy about it. But again, um, I think the stash away stance is to continue to focus on the economic numbers and continue to maintain the right risk profile to avoid the whipsaw, the flip flop that's going to happen. The key reason for our stance is because we 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 knew that the trade war is not about trade. The trade war, in many ways, is a bit of a miniature version of a cold war. As elements of intellectual property violation. I think that's really coming out right now, right? Exactly. Huawei is in the crossfire of all of this right now, exactly. right? Everywhere. 5G domination, yeah. uh, robotics domination, made in China 2025 plans. Um, there's a lot of mistrust on both sides of uh, between the US and China. So, uh, you know, years of getting China into the World Trade Organization yeah. has not seen uh, the very good behavior in terms of opening up for free trade. But China, in return, looking at the new administration, it's a regime change. The Trump administration is no longer a reliable partner for, for, yeah. for the Chinese. Hence, they crafted the Made in China 2025 plan. Uh, the Chinese tech sectors are huge, but the, all the chips and the semiconductors and all the parts are made by uh, US manufacturers. Obviously, you don't feel safe. So there's a lot of mistrust on both sides. This is not going to be resolved because of no. By, by much. No, I think what, what's interesting to see now this week, I, I read it on the, on the European news more so, is China was really relying, hopefully, that they can just do more trade with other countries, right? But I think it was in the German news, actually, that they're really worried now about, they were like the actual car manufacturers and everyone, they were saying, yeah, IP problems with China are a real problem, also for them. So they're cautioning the whole 
And the, U and the U.S. is actively telling foreign governments right. to not use Huawei's uh, equipment, for yeah. example. So um, there's a lot of such things that will go on and on and on. Yeah. I think the best case scenario is by March, we have a face-saving hurrah. Both sides have a face-saving win. Yeah. But, you know, as you know, Donald Trump, he could in months later change his mind, say something again. So as investors, our best way of navigating this is to, yes, Focus on economic numbers, set the risk really, really solidly tight, solidly right, compatible to your tolerance, to your preference, to your background, and continue to do dollar cost averaging because as when the market flip down, you buy more units with the same amount of money. When the market goes up a lot, you buy less units, you average it out, that's the best way to to build a portfolio for yeah. long-term success, and especially if you have a if you have a really diversified portfolio, which uh, which you know all of our customers do have. The great thing is, if something goes up, something else goes down. You can ever you, if you average it into that portfolio in general, right? So you might be picking up some of some that's better down and some of them that's up. Uh, you still have it stored in your portfolio, so you need to have that diversification. Yeah, right? the periodic so you don't get the periodic averaging into the market reduces the volatility, yeah. as opposed to in, investing entirely your whole life savings today, and that's going to be subject to all the whipsaw in the market right away. Yeah. Uh, the way to really navigate through all these flip flops is to average your savings into a certain period of time and that is the best way to navigate yeah and on that topic so uh, maybe we'll talk about one of the other um, big things that's been going on the entire time of 2018 uh, and most of 2017 because when it happened mm. uh, first um, brexit it's been now uh, what two and a half years since the decision by the uh, British people and they're to still debating what they and it's want. still not uh, termed, uh, terminated uh, the whole thing, right? So it's a uh, quite interesting show and um, very public, obviously, because in the UK they um, show everything on TV, right? Yes, it's all live. Uh, so it makes for entertaining news. But while it's entertaining, it's also the future of a lot of people and a lot of uh, in general. They, it's, there's no new trade agreements. They can't do anything right now, right? Before there is a definitive thing. Mm -hmm. So this week it was quite. Um, obvious that there's still so much divide, right? That no one knows really what they want. Or what they knew what they want, but no one can get what they want because there's no majority for either, right? The problem with the whole Brexit situation is that um, United Kingdom is made up of a lot of different uh, countries. Yeah. Historically, they couldn't agree. And henceforth, which brings me to the core part, which is the Irish border. As you know, um, Northern Ireland it's a terror state in, uh, historically, and uh, Ireland is uh, a, a much more laissez-faire sort of economy. And when United Kingdom come in place, uh, Northern Ireland was brought in, and there was this border issue. And that border was, uh, was, was rid of, and we have free flow of uh, tr transportation and trade, and that really facilitates the integration of Northern Ireland with Ireland. So the Irish border is a big tricky point because Ireland is uh, culturally, not culturally, historically they want they are more pro EU. As you know, the referendum is quite tight. So when you have a referendum, they decide to leave, but there's still a big amount of people, near don't, equal, yeah. that don't. And Ireland falls into one of those is more pro EU, whereas the rest of the UK is also quite divided. And then the I Northern Ireland problem is to how do we keep them into the United Kingdom? free passporting, free, free trade flow. Um, the only way to do it is to have a backstop in terms of the being in the customs union. When you leave the EU, uh, that you still have some sort of customs union which ensures that, that your passport still works in, yeah. across the border. Um, that's really pro business, but you can't satisfy everyone in this referendum. Opposition parties, the labor have other priorities. Prime Minister Theresa May is never set up to succeed. No. So she's just uh, taking on something that is not in the first place her doing. No. So um, they still can't decide what they want. It's going to be a lot of uh, hot air and fast and noises. Uh, what I'm sure is that there's a general consensus they are trying to avoid a no deal Brexit, which is really disastrous. You just crash out of the European Union without 
specific agreement on how you're going to import medical supplies with any country, from any country yeah. whether your passport uh, still works in the European Union. Um, I, I think uh, the best way to do so is to call another referendum and also extend the deadline of the exits. So, um, so what, are, what are the kind of like, you say for a second referendum, you could, a lot of people are arguing against it for the reason of democracy because other, some people argue that, oh, okay, so we call another referendum, then this time by 1% the um, remains are going to win. Then the other ones say, okay, so now we need to do a third one just to see who really wins. You know, because it can get go on because they think like, it's like, oh, let's do as many referendums until someone like gets well, their way, right? One of, the, one of the excuses or justification was there's so much fake uh, uh, news in the last referendum people who missell the benefits of Brexit and a lot of uh, commoners do not understand the full implication of yeah. Brexit. Uh, there's just so much fake statements being made and by now it's quite clear a lot of people are having second remorse. So the second uh, referendum is definitely talked about. Yeah. Uh, Theresa May is denying that, uh, that, that, uh, yeah. that tendency but uh, we all know that that can be uh, uh, very much been on the table. Yeah. Um, either way, they're crashing out with a very tight deadline, and it's most likely that an extension uh, will be sick to to buy more time. Yeah, but again, I think for investors themselves, I think what 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 the message here is again, this there might be a lot of short term, right? Especially if you you know you don't want to be trading probably the, any of the pound pairs, right? If you're a trader, but for investors, it just keeps the same message as on China, right? Globally diversified portfolio will be shielded from these isolated events in Europe. They might have some more volatility in end of March, right? When all well, the good news on, is the British referendum, all the new, all the hot air around it is quite isolated in terms of its impact. If you look at even the last few weeks when the pound was moving a lot, yeah. it's really confined to UK assets and a bit of Europe. Um, the rest of the world is really quite indifferent in terms of market reactions. And the global diversified approach really works yeah. because your exposure to a specific market that's been subject to such digital uh, event risk is very low. So completely in agreement with what you just yeah. said. So then uh, the next big thing that, you know, and the last thing I think we're going to touch before we get into some more uh, strategy is government shutdown in the US, right? This is really dominating the news just because of uh, our favorite Twitter person, right? Because it's just been constant right now, right? Like I'm not signing anything until the wall is up, right? It's kind of like right. the funding is there for the wall. He doesn't. He didn't let Pelosi, um, Nancy Pelosi, yesterday to the troops to use a um, government aircraft, right? Yes. But his wife was allowed to fly on a government aircraft somewhere. Which I heard. But anyways, yeah. Um, but maybe you can kind of give an uh, give an overview because we didn't talk about it before uh, the Christmas break because it just happened right then. But what kind of happened? So why it's going on? Maybe? Well, I think for investors, the key thing is um, every week when a government is shut down, um, the estimates of the economic damage used to be 0.05% per week, now 0.1%. Um, the number does not account for the fact that the US government is a huge, monstrous department that has a lot of contractors, not employees of government, but uh, private independent businesses that have contracts and services of government. Those companies are really going to be the one that's most affected. Uh, so the numbers uh, could actually go up the, the more prolonged the shutdown is. So at the moment, we have been about what three weeks or four weeks into the shutdown. Like 25, 26. Yeah, about yeah, three yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah, so the economic damage estimates, according to economists, has gone to from 0.15% to 0.3 now in total. I pers personally, I believe that the, the impact would be bigger, and 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 uh, if this prolonged further, but the stress is really on Trump. He took ownership by saying he's proud to shut down the government. The Democrats are just being very smart about it and refusing to really cave in. But the owner is really on the Republican Party and it's on Trump. Yeah, because I think the Democrats are doing a really good job also. At, they're always proposing something every week to, yes. to end it, right? So they're always going to look like, hey, we tried again. And he's just being stubborn, right? So that's why I was actually going to ask you next was, what's your take on, like, obviously you already said that it might be impacting Trump the most, right? But so it's really, our ratings, you know, is this? I think they're actually gonna go away for like oh I because a lot of people that also he voted for are affected now for once, right? 
Yes, um, but they still stick with him. They're still quite united as a party. Mm. So Republicans have not sold out on the president uh, in the Senate. So they will always still veto whatever comes from the House, which is uh, dominated by the Democrats. But I think looking beyond the shutdown, the implication is that the government going forward will be in a gridlock. They will not yeah. be able to agree to anything. Now, in the Trump world, is it a good news or is it bad news? In the past, I used to say this is bad news. But in the Trump world, this is actually good yeah. because now there's a lot of checks and balances. Maybe it also means there's a lot of damage control versus yeah. 2018. I would see personally as good news that there's, there's now more checks and balances against a very impulsive, erratic administration. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so with that, so I think now we talked about kind of like the three pain points that you know went with us all of 2018. They're kind of all flowing back into this year as well, right? Like they're kind of all coming back again. Or well, still here, right? They've not gone away. However, everyone thought this trade war, this you know Brexit, and all this stuff caused a correction uh, year starting October, right? Middle uh, beginning of October, middle of October. And now you know the market completely recovered. Like last time we did um, we did this session here, the market commentary before we went all on holiday yeah. was kind of oh my god, right? This was like worst time. This was before the big bounce back after Christmas, right? Yes. So we're kind of back now, right? Well, um, I think the key thing is that investors always talk about market crashes and all, but fail to distinguish between when the market declines, is it accompanied by an economic decline? If that's also an economic decline, uh, you, you may get a bear market and your portfolio will need to start switching asset mix towards a different medium term environment. But that's not the case today. We have an economy, in the US in particular, that is still doing really solid. And actually, so the Christmas crash is an opportunity for the medium to long term investors. And uh, the only way for uh, retail investors and, and us ourselves investing our savings, the only way for us to really have long-term success is to follow the, the real core principles of never borrow money to invest, yeah. set the right risk level that's compatible to your goals and your preference, and also to average into the markets. Have a plan that you contribute regularly so that not all your money is exposed right away and you navigate easier, it, it helps you not to overreact to the market. When the market drops, you sell, and the market comes back higher, you buy, and the market flip flop again. One way, two way, you you know, is double the value. If the market is down ten percent and it's up ten percent, you're selling when it's down, you're buying back when it's up, and it flips again, you lose twenty percent easily, and that's really difficult for traders, really difficult for spe speculators and active managers. However, the, the long-term investors who average in, who holds, who invest in savings and does all the basics of uh, financial planning, they're flat and they don't have to react. So we would just really want to focus uh, the, on the core principles of long-term success. Yeah, and I think one of the things is also, let's say you time the, uh, the, the correction perfectly at the beginning, there's always two halves to that, right? Mm. It's not just getting out of the market at the right time, but when do you ever enter at the, when is ever the right time to enter, right? There's so many corrections if you go back in the past, right? Where you're like, like I think 2016 it was, right? There was a correction. Um, well, if you right use a JP Morgan number, they yeah. did a 25 year study just on S&P alone. If that's all you're going to invest in, the long term average for the 25 year period was 9.8% yeah. in return. Uh, taking all the downturn and all the upturn, just doing, just, just staying put. However, for those who market time and just missed the 10 best best days in, 25 years. in that 25 years, return gone down by one third from 9.8 to 6.32%. That's a huge amount if you want to, if you have long-term goals, right? Exactly, yeah, you I miss do. another 10 yeah. best days, it goes down to 3.3. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you know, so really uh, market timing, it can be a very costly endeavor when you get it wrong. Very, very, very costly. And it's never easy mm. to get back in. So well, hey, thanks, thank you, Freddie. I think that was pretty helpful for everyone. Um, and again, um, this will be our new uh, weekly commentary format going forward. So I'm excited to um, speak to you all again next week. Um, again, any questions, please write those in the comment section below the video. We'll gather them together and then um, throughout the next few weeks uh, address those as well uh, together. So have a wonderful weekend and uh, we will speak to you next week. Till then. Bye-bye.